3.6 static equilibrium. This lesson is for um, Wednesday, November 5th. Let's move on to the lesson. All right, let's just review solving problems in physics. Just remember you have to write out the variables, include the directions, draw a picture, um, and based on the variables and values, choose the appropriate equation, and then plug into the equation and solve for the unknown. All right, let's also review what is static equilibrium. Let's just remember um, equilibrium exists when the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero, and the velocity is constant. That's because if an object moves with constant velocity, we know that its acceleration, which is the slope of velocity versus time, is zero. All right? Uh, so if the, if the velocity is constant, then the acceleration is zero. And because the acceleration is zero, the net force equals mass times acceleration or mass times zero, which gives you a net force of zero. So equilibrium exists when you have a net force of zero, an acceleration of zero, and a constant velocity. And static equilibrium is, an, is equilibrium where an object is at rest and the sum of all of the forces acting on it equals zero. So in other words, the object should be at rest number one and the net force should be equal to zero. So um, just remember that the main difference between equilibrium and static equilibrium is that static equilibrium occurs when the object is at rest. All right, and these are the four forces you should know. Applied force, uh, frictional force, gravitational force going down, and normal force going up. And just note that frictional force and applied force um, can change. This could go left and frictional force could go right. It just depends on which way the applied force is going. So if the applied force is going left, then frictional force will go right. But if the applied force is going right, then the frictional force will go left. That's all you got to remember. Just remember static equilibrium, what equilibrium means, and um, these four main forces. All right, now let's review uh, motion graphs in equilibrium. Um, basically, an object moves forward during uniform motion. So it's a positive slope for G versus T as a straight line. So um, that also means it moves at a constant speed. So just remember, if the object moves forward at a constant speed, then it's a straight line and a positive slope. All right, so if you have an object moving forward, meaning a positive slope with the constant speed, a straight line for D versus T, then you know you have equilibrium. That's because you have a constant velocity or a horizontal line for V versus T, and acceleration is zero because you can see that right here. And therefore, since acceleration is equal to zero, so is net force. All right, so equilibrium is shown by um, an object moving forward at a constant speed, which is a straight line and a positive slope for D versus T. V versus T is a flat horizontal line, and A equals zero. So therefore, net force is equal to zero. For constant non-zero accelerated motion, just remember that you have speed increasing with the positive slope and curving upwards for D versus T. That's how you remember accelerated motion. And it's not equilibrium because the velocity is increasing instead of being constant, and the acceleration is not equal to zero, so therefore the net force is not equal to zero. So we know it's not equilibrium because A versus T is not at zero. Um, the velocity is increasing instead of being constant, and the net force is not equal to zero. It's the opposite of what equilibrium is. All right. Um, now we have. Uh, now we're going to talk about the range of equilibrant force vectors. As we remember, um, as you um, increase the angle, you decrease the magnitude of the equilibrant force vector. So now we got to apply that to find out the range of equilibrant force vectors that can that you can use to help solve the problem. All right, so let's just remember equilibrant is a force vector that brings the resultant to equilibrium. In other words, it's equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the resultant. Because if the resultant is going like 5 newtons southeast, then the result the resultant would be opposed by the equilibrant, which is 5 newtons, let's say, northwest, because it balances out whatever the resultant is. If the resultant is 5 newtons southeast, uh, once again, the equilibrant would be 5 newtons northwest to cancel it out. All right, and the range of the equilibrant force vectors depends on uh, the values of the vectors um, at two different angles. So you get the following range. You go from the smallest possible magnitude, which is a result of vector subtraction at 180 degrees to the largest possible magnitude, which is vector addition at zero degrees. That's let's remember because if you're at 180, the vectors are going in opposite directions, so you subtract them. So that's the smallest possible magnitude. The largest possible magnitude is when the vectors are going in the same direction at zero degrees, so you can add them up. All right. So let's try an example to see what that means. But just remember, you go from um, the smallest po possible magnitude, which exists when you subtract the vectors, to the largest possible magnitude, which is when you add the vectors up, actually. All right, so the example here says a 7-newton force and a 6-newton force act concurrently on an object. Name the range of possible values for the force vector that could produce equilibrium of these two forces, as well as one possible value for the force vector that could not produce 
produce equilibrium with these two forces. So let's first cover the range of possible values for the equilibrium force vector. Let's remember you go from the value from vector subtraction to the value gotten as a um, result of vector addition. The vector subtraction is the smallest value often at 180 degrees, while the vector addition is the largest value at 0 degrees. So if we subtract 7 and 6, we get 7 minus 6 equals 1 for vector subtraction, so that's the smallest possible value, 1 newton for the equilibrium. On the other hand, the largest possible value is the resultant uh, vector addition, which is when you add 7 and 6 together to get 13 newtons. So 13 newtons is the largest possible value. So the range of possible values we can get is from the smallest value of 1 newton to the largest possible value of 13 newtons. All right, so any number between 1 and 13 inclusive will get you an equivalent force vector that will produce equilibrium. So you could use 6, 7, you could use 13, you could use 1, you could use 2, you could use 10, just as long as it's between the vector subtraction value and the vector addition value, it's valid to find equilibrium with it. All right? And the force factor that does not produce equilibrium is something that's outside the range of acceptable values. The range is 1 to 13. So if you had 15 newtons, that could not produce equilibrium because it's outside the range of 1 to 13 for the acceptable values. So there you go. Just remember, the, value, the range of acceptable equilibrium force factors that will give you equilibrium are from the smallest possible magnitude, which is vector subtraction at 180 degrees, to the largest possible magnitude, which is vector addition at 0 degrees. All right, now let's talk about tension. Tension is represented by the symbol capital T. And tension is the force that causes a rope or a chain to be taut or pulled tight. All right, T is tension. That's the force that basically, you know, causes a chain or a rope to be pulled tightly. And its direction is usually always upwards. Tension points up because it keeps the rope or chain pulled tight and not loose or falling down. So it points upwards because it keeps the rope or chain pulled tight. And in an elevator, for example, the tension would be up, whereas the weight or the gravitational force, which is equal to mg, would point down. All right, let's just go over this really, really quickly, because um, I don't want to go into too much detail with this. But um, when you have when you have to resolve vectors with static equilibrium, you have to make sure that both the horizontal and vertical components have a vector sum of zero overall, leading to static equilibrium. Because in order to have equilibrium, the net force has to be equal to zero overall. So that's why you know that the net force in the y direction and the net force in the x direction both have to be equal to zero. All right. So just make sure. Make sure that F net Y and F net X are equal to zero so that you get static equilibrium because for equilibrium, you need net force to be equal to zero. So let's try an example here. A spherical toy whose weight is 20 newtons is on a string. A student pulls the sphere horizontally to the right so that the rope of the string makes a 47.3 degree angle with the horizontal. If the spherical toy is at rest at the, in this position, what is the tension T in the string and what force E does the student exert in the toy? So if we notice, we can just plug in what we know. Um, we know that the tension of the string um, is pulled at a 45 degree angle to the horizontal. So we know that the tension of the string that's keeping it tight is at 47.3 degrees. All right, we know that the um, force exerted on the student is, uh, we can think of it as pointing um, to the right because the student is being pulled right, so the student pushes on the toy to the right. And the gravitational force obviously is pointing down, and we know it's 20 newtons. The weight is 20 newtons. We know that the tension is at an angle 47.3 degrees, and we know that the student is exerting a force of E on the toy. We can call it for the variable. Because the student um, is obviously um, the student is obviously pulling the toy to the right. All right? So it says F net equals T plus E plus FG is equal to zero. Let's remember net force has to be equal to zero for equilibrium. So the sum of these three forces, no matter what their magnitudes are, always equals zero together. So let's do F net in the Y direction and F net in the X direction. We know that for F net Y, TY, which is the Y axis of the tension, plus the Y axis of the E, meaning the force that the student exerts in the toy, plus the gravitational force in the y direction has to all be equal to zero. All right, so, so far, here's what we know. We know that um, E does not act in the y direction. It's not pointing up at all, so we can cross out E. Also, we know that um, gravitational force is negative 20 newtons because it's pointing down. We can think of south as negative direction, so it's negative 20 newtons. The EY, again, is zero, and the tension, we know um, you have to use... Uh, you have to use um, a, a y is equal to a sine theta. So we know that here, 
the tension's y value is equal to t times the sine of the angle that it is to the horizontal, which is 47.3 degrees. So we plug that in. Ty is equal to t sine 47.3 degrees. We know ey has no y value, so it's zero. And fgy is negative 20 because it's pointing down. And all three of those together has to be equal to zero according to this rule up here. All right, and if we solve, we'll get t sine 47.3 degrees equals 20 newtons. If we divide for sine of 47.3 degrees from both sides, you get 20 divided by sine 47.3 degrees gives you 27.21 newtons for the tension. All right, so we found the tension value just based on T sine 47.3 degrees equals 20 newtons. We just plug it in. On the other hand, we have to find the um, vector sum of F net X. And we know that the sum of all of these, um, all the X components of these three forces has to be equal to zero because that's what it says for our rule. Make sure that the vertical components have a vector sum of zero overall. So we know these three x um, axis values added has to be equal to zero. So let's figure that out. For t, we know that um, we have to have negative cosine of 47.3 degrees. And that's because t is um, pointing in the negative um, x direction. Think of this as put a line through this, and if you see this, t is pointing in the negative x direction this way. So we put it as negative t cosine 47.3 plus e, which is pointing to the right, so you know that it has a positive x value of e, uh, plus fgx, which is 0 is equal to 0. All right, so let me just break this down. Again, this is negative t cosine 47.3 degrees because according to the equation, it's a cosine of theta, and we know that since t is pointing in the negative x direction to the left, we put as negative cosine 47.3. E is um, positive E because E is only pointing in the positive x direction, so we put that as positive E. FGX has only a y value, no x value, so we put that as zero here. And the sum of these three has to be equal to zero. And if you plug in and solve for it, um, you'll note that E is equal to T cosine 47.3 degrees. Um, if you um, add t cosine 47.3 to both sides. All right, so if you add t cosine 47.3 to both sides, you get, um, and you plug in from the previous uh, questions uh, value for t, you get 27.21, which is what you found in the previous step, times cosine of 47.3 gives you 18.46 newtons for the force that the student exerts on the toy. All right, um, now let's move on to our next part. Uh, sample problems level one. So it says, if a force of 34, point, 34 newtons north and a force of 34 newtons south acts concurrently on a 2.0 kilogram cart, what's the acceleration? We know that the net force has to be the sum of the two vectors together. One's going north, which is positive, so we put positive 43 newtons, sorry, positive 34 newtons for the first one, plus a negative 43 newtons, 34 newtons for the second one, because 34 newtons south is the negative direction, so you do 34 newtons north, which is positive, plus negative 34 newtons because 34 newtons south is negative, you get a net force of zero because these two balance each other. They're going in opposite directions with equal magnitude, so the net force is zero. Since the net force is zero, we know acceleration is zero and velocity is constant, so therefore the acceleration is zero here because the net force is balanced out to zero because they're equal but opposite directions. So um, since the net force is zero, we know the acceleration is zero. It's not accelerating if it's at equilibrium. That's how we know acceleration is equal to zero. Also, um, for number two, if the sum of all the forces acting on a moving object is zero, what will happen to the object? Since the object's moving, the object will continue to move, and it'll move so at a constant velocity, because since the object is already moving, we know it's to continue moving, because no unbalanced force is acting on it. And it's moving at a constant velocity, because for equilibrium, the velocity is always constant. All right? A spring scale reads 40 newtons as it pulls a 6.0 kilogram mass across the table. Find the magnitude of the force exerted by the mass on the spring scale. We know it's 40 newtons because according to Newton's third law, every action leads to an equal but opposite reaction. So since the spring scale pulls with the force of 40 newtons, the um, mass on the spring scale has to have an equal, but, equal magnitude but opposite direction force. So it's 40 newtons in terms of magnitude. Here, same thing, it's 108 newtons that the runner exerts on the boat, so it has to be equal but opposite. Here, same thing, the uh, astronaut exerts a force of 20 newtons on the button, so the button always has, also has to exert a force with a magnitude of 20 newtons but in the opposite direction.
All right, you can try these problems on your own. A lot of this is just review from previous questions, but please com complete these on your own for Wednesday, November 5th.